Okay, I think we can get started and maybe a few more people will join us. Um, with apologies, I have quite bad internet, so I'm going to turn off my video now. But it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce our BCI Thursday's Next Generation speaker today, Dr. Amy Orsborn. Amy is an assistant professor in electrical and computer engineering and bioengineering at the University of Washington. And before that, she earned her PhD in bioengineering at UC Berkeley and UCSF, working with Jose Corina's group. She developed dual learner BCIs where both the brain and the algorithms co-adapt. And then she did her postdoctoral training at NYU in Bijan Pesteron's group, where she developed cutting edge new neural implants for recording, recording from multiple brain areas and with multiple scales of resolution. And she's won a number of awards, including the L'Oreal for Women in Science Fellowship. Thank you, Amy, for joining us today and telling us about our work. And I'll let you take over. Uh, just one quick note, please feel free to ask questions throughout in the uh, Q&A box. And also please uh, do upvote questions that you're particularly interested in. And then at the end, I can go through them and read those out to Amy and she'll be happy to answer all your questions. Everyone, please welcome Amy. All right, great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Sergey. And I'm really uh, excited to be here today. Um, so, here we go. All right, um, so I like to think about brain-machine interfaces as sort of changing the way that our central nervous system interacts with the external world. Uh, so we can use recording technologies to um, measure activity in the brain and use that to control things in the environment. And we can also use neural stimulation to write information from the environment back into the central nervous system. And this opens up lots of really exciting possibilities for thinking about how we could study the brain and also how we could treat neurological disorders. So if you have someone who has a spinal cord injury, for instance, you could record the activity from intact parts of their motor system, like the motor cortex, and use that to control a external device, like a computer cursor to restore movement. And so there's lots of different types of brain machine interfaces, but that example of a motor brain machine interface is the main one that I focus on and what we'll be talking about primarily today. And this of course is not new, it's been around for a while now and many of you are probably familiar with really exciting clinical trials showing um, that this does in fact work, that you can restore movements to people with uh, paralysis using activity measured from motor cortex. So we typically think about those kinds of brain machine interfaces as a machine learning problem that we focus on the idea of decoding uh, someone's motor intent. And if we understood exactly how the brain represented movement, we could build the perfect decoding algorithm, send that command to a robot, problem solved. But in practice, that's actually quite different from how a brain machine interface is used. So that control signal that you get to send to the robot goes to the robot and the robot then moves and the user has feedback about that movement. And so the brain is in a direct closed loop dialogue with the device. And so decades of research have shown that this kind of changes the problem of brain machine interfaces, from not just simply one of machine learning. And in particular, there are kind of two key things uh, to, to point out. One is that the neural encoding of how the brain is representing movement might actually change between controlling your natural limbs and controlling a brain machine interface. And so that perfect algorithm that might predict arm movements won't necessarily work in the same way when you're uh, controlling a, a robotic limb, for instance. The other thing is that neural encoding can change with practice over time in a brain machine interface itself because the brain is able to learn and change. And so these two things might seem initially somewhat surprising if you're used to thinking about a brain machine interface from a machine learning perspective. But if we look at this diagram, it actually makes some sense. One key reason that encoding might be different is that the thing that the brain is controlling is different. Controlling a robotic limb is very different than controlling the natural arm. So it might make sense that the encoding could be different. And the changes in adaptation uh, in encoding that can change over time is related to this closed loop interaction. The feedback allows the brain to learn and change. And so 
so I like to think of, uh, so given all of this, uh, I like to think of brain machine interfaces rather than trying to decode natural movement as instead building a new motor system that the brain learns how to control. And so with that new framing of the problem, what we need is sort of what I think of as closed loop design strategies um, to understand how to build that new motor system. And so we're gonna to talk today about um, key pieces of these kind of closed loop design strategies. And the main one we'll focus on is this idea of closed loop decoder adaptation, where we can adapt to the decoder in real time in the context of controlling a brain machine interface. We'll next talk about how that uh, adaptive decoding interacts with the brain that can also be adapting at the same time. And I'll just quickly mention that there are also other really important considerations in this framing of kind of closed loop design of brain machine interfaces that I think of as system design, kind of how we design all of the other pieces of the loop. Um, but we're not really going to focus on that today. But I just wanted to mention that there's lots of other uh, strategies and approaches uh, in this, this broader context of the problem. Okay. And the um, approaches that I'm going to be talking about today are focusing on, um, I'll use a preclinical animal model of uh, motor brain machine interfaces. Many of you may be familiar with this um, model. Uh, we work with rhesus macaque monkeys and we train them to do natural reaching behaviors and then we do invasive implants uh, to the motor areas, typically motor cortex, premotor cortex, to record activity of neurons in the brain. We use the activity of those neurons as inputs into decoding algorithms, and those decoding algorithms are translating the firing rate of neurons into kinematics, and the kinematics that are being controlled are of virtual movements, so they're moving cursors on a computer screen. Um, and then the monkey has feedback, typically just visual feedback. They can see the cursor moving on the screen, and that creates that closed-loop control system. So first, let's talk about closed loop decoder adaptation. One of the uh, biggest challenges that I mentioned in this uh, in brain machine interfaces is that we don't necessarily always know what the right encoding uh, algorithm or encoding representation in the brain might be. So one strategy for coming up and to solve that issue is uh, by learning the decoder parameters in the context of a brain machine interface. So if you have a user controlling a brain machine interface with some original decoder, you can look at the mistakes that they make and get some sort of error signal that they, you, you then use to update and retrain your decoder as the user is controlling the device. And this idea is what we call closed loop decoder adaptation or CLDA. And so this has a lot of potential applications. One is this issue that we might not necessarily know what the, the right decoder parameters are ahead of time for a particular brain machine interface. And the other is for maintaining performance over time, given that it's very difficult to measure the same population of neurons um, over time, um, especially on the time scales of years, for instance, that a brain machine interface would be used. So there's lots of different types of um, CLDA algorithms. One of the most important things is how we get that error signal to train the, the algorithm. So one of the most common approaches is supervised methods where you have some knowledge of what the correct answer should be. So typically this is done through knowing something about the task that a user is trying to perform and so you know what movements they should be making. Um, and you can use that supervised signal to then retrain your decoder parameters. But there are also unsupervised approaches um, where you, the idea is to not actually have any um, up clear information um, uh, of what the right answer should be, and you can update the decoder parameters. These typically take the form of, for instance, smoothing um, or also matching templates um, uh, over time. 
Uh, and then the last sort of interesting approach that's been explored um, is reinforcement learning. Uh, where you, rather than knowing for sure what the right answer is, you know whether a um, trial was correct or incorrect, and you can then use reinforcement learning approaches to update your decoder parameters. And one of the reasons that reinforcement learning is particularly interesting is that we know that we can measure these kinds of error signals of that was correct or that was incorrect from neural activity itself. Um, and so there's been some really interesting work suggesting that this could be a useful framework for CLDA uh, that would let us um, build unsupervised approaches. Um, and most of the work that I've done is in supervised algorithms. And so that's the main thing that we're going to be talking about, uh, about from here. But in addition to the error signal that we have, once we have that error signal, there are still a lot of design choices that have to be made for the algorithm itself. Um, so we use the error signal to update the decoder. And when we do that, we have to think about the time scale on which we're gonna update the decoder. How much data do we wanna use? Um, the parameters within our model that we want to update. Do we wanna update all of the parameters? Do we only wanna update a subset? And then also the rules themselves, so the mathematical algorithm that relates the error signal to the changes in the parameters that you make. And uh, we've done a lot of research uh, showing that the design choices that you make in these CLDA algorithms are going to really influence their performance, and in particular influence kind of what they are most useful for. So in the context of, for instance, when you don't know what the right uh, decoder parameters are, you might need to design a different algorithm uh, compared to if your goal is to maintain performance. And the other really important thing about CLDA algorithms is that they ultimately need to be tested experimentally in a closed loop system where they are interacting with the user. You need a subject in the loop um, because the interactions between the algorithm and the subject may ultimately influence uh, the way that the algorithm behaves the algorithm is not operating kind of in, in isolation. And so now what I'm gonna do is a case study where I talk about, um, I show you a particular CLDA algorithm that we developed for one particular application goal. Um, and so our particular goal was to understand how to train a decoding algorithm when we had no idea what the right uh, decoding parameters should be. So we wanted to have start with a completely random initial decoder and be able to train it um, quickly. Um, and so this would be potentially very useful in a clinical setting. Um, and so our goals were to improve performance regardless of the initial conditions of our parameter uh, decoder parameters. And we wanted to do that really quickly and we wanted to the algorithm to converge um, to some stable performance so that we didn't need to continually adapt to the decoder over time. And so I'm going to show you the answer of the solution that we found that worked well for that particular goal. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the design choices that influenced, um, that inform, uh, explain the algorithm's success. So the algorithm that we came up with that we call smooth batch. Um, and the idea is that, uh, so it's a supervised algorithm. So we have a monkey using a brain machine interface in closed loop. And the, we get the error signal um, by knowing that we've given the animal a task. So if the animal is trying to get this orange cursor to the blue target, but their cursor is going off in the wrong direction, um, we know that they, what they probably meant to do is reach their cursor straight towards that blue target. So that gives us training data where we can now look at the neural activity in their brain and what they meant to do rather than what they actually did. We can use that data to then create a new update of the decoder. But what SmoothBatch does is have a trade-off between updating the decoder quickly because we're starting with some bad initial performance and maintaining smooth performance that uh, updates that are not noisy. And we do that by updating the decoder on short batches of data, about one to two minutes, and then smoothing parameter updates over time. Um, so rather than simply relying on this small amount of data, we 
take a sliding average of those decoder parameters over the last several batches that we've seen. And we iteratively improve performance over time that way. And so we tested this experimentally with monkeys that were trying to uh, perform a center outreaching task in brain machine interfaces. And we initialized our decoders with some random uh, initial settings. And then we looked at uh, how performance on the task changed over time. So in black is the success rate, and in blue is the um, rate of errors that the animal makes. And so when we start with random initial parameters, the animal actually isn't even able to make mistakes. Uh, the cursor is just sitting off in the corner of the screen because the decoder is poorly calibrated. Then over time, what you can see is that the subject begins actually able to make some mistakes and then eventually getting a couple of successes. And then you see this sort of exponential rise in successes that reaches a plateau. If we stop adapting the decoder, we find then that performance remains high. So we've converged to some stable solution that the animal is unable to use um, without adaptation. And like we mentioned, one of our goals was that this should be really robust. And so we tested this lots of different times, um, over 56 sessions, and we initialized those random decoder parameters lots of different ways. Um, and what we found is that regardless of how we initialized our decoders, in all cases, we were kind of starting out in a worst case scenario where the initial guess was really poor and the animal couldn't do the task at all. But by the time we ran our adaptive decoding, we could always get to the same final performance, regardless of where uh, our initial decoder parameters were. And importantly, this converged relatively quickly. Um, so the animal went from not being able to do the task at all to being able to hit all of the targets in a little over 10 minutes. And they got to maximum performance on, in 20 minutes on average. And so, uh, like I mentioned, there were kind of a lot of design choices that we had to make as we were developing Smooth Batch. Um, and one is the parameters that we want to update. So, uh, Smooth Batch data that I just showed you was run on a Kalman filter. Um, and if you're familiar with the Kalman filter models, it has uh, two key equations that govern. Uh, how it, the model. So there's a state transition model that says how the cursor kinematics evolve over time. For instance, saying that position is going to be the integral of velocity. And then there's an observation model that tells you how neural activity is related to movement. And the common filter combines those two things, an estimate of where the cursor should be at the next time point based on how the cursor moves with where the cursor should be based on the neural measurements together in an optimal, Bayesian optimal framework. And so the um, a priori, the assumption would be that we should probably update all of these parameters in our, in our model, because um, we wouldn't want to necessarily constrain ourselves. But what we found is that if we update all of the decoder parameters, both the state model and the observation model, the cursor just started gradually slowing down over time. So what I'm showing you here is the cursor speed um, here, that as we update the decoder each time, the cursor just progressively got slower and slower and slower. And when we looked at what was happening within the Kalman filter, uh, what we see is that the model is basically getting more confident in the state transition model because you're training it on data that was generated with a state transition model. And so uh, in the common filter, what that does is actually reduce the amount of uh, input that neural activity has on the cursor. So if we were to run this forever, the model would basically completely ignore neural activity and just sort of be very confident that the cursor should be staying still. That's not very helpful. So instead, what we found is that if we think about adaptive decoding a little differently, that we have a cursor that has some physics about how it moves and we keep that fixed and then only adapt the observation model of how neural activity relates to cursor movement 
then we get uh, the performance that we would like. Um, so we no longer have this issue that the cursor slows down um, and uh, performance remains high. So all of the data that I showed you before was using this approach where we uh, constrained the parts of the common filter that we were training. Um, another important design choice that we made um, was related to the uh, adaptation timescales. Um, so smooth batch makes these uses these small batches and then averages them over time. But an alternate approach would be a batch based method where we just simply collect data for a really long period of time so that we can make one very reliable estimate. And what we found is that smooth batch um, by making those batches smaller, um, we can update more quickly and therefore improve performance uh, more quickly um, when you start compared to a, a batch approach. And one of the reasons why um, this was particularly true goes back to this issue that there's a subject in the loop that's interacting with the algorithm. So if we looked at you know, how many trials the subject was uh, attempting to perform in the batch based versus smooth batch approach, you can see that with that sort of quick updates and changes to the decoder, that the subject becomes more engaged and continues to try even if they're not necessarily succeeding. If you ask a subject to try for 10 minutes to struggle with a very poorly performing decoder, they're going to quickly get fatigued and their strategies are going to become more variable and it becomes difficult for the machine learning algorithms to then understand how to update the decoder parameters. And so in particular, when you're starting from low initial performance, it's really important to have sort of these rapid adaptation timescales uh, so that you, because of these interactions with the user. And so based on that, um, some of those observations that we made about uh, the, how uh, smooth batch succeeded, we then, um, I then collaborated with Mariam Shinichi to further optimize these CLDA algorithms. So one was we noticed that that adaptation timescale was really important. And so we pushed that further to have parameters that actually update every iteration of the, of the BMI decoder. So on a millisecond timescale rather than minutes. And when we did that, we found that we could get that convergence time down really significantly. Um, and so smooth batch algorithms took about 20 minutes to converge, but when we shifted the adaptation rate much faster, uh, we could get that time down to about six minutes. We also did some work uh, looking at the training signal that we used as well. So rather than just sort of simply rotating the velocity and assuming that you meant to move at the same speed, but you want to move straight towards the cursor, we could actually build an optimal feedback control model of how the user was trying to control the cursor and use that to estimate their intention. And when we did that, we found that we could actually improve the success rate overall um, because we had better training data for the, for the um, decoder. And so that led to an improvement in success rate um, without changing, uh, so the subjects were moving more quickly and uh, straighter without uh, increasing any of the uh, reach error. Um, and so one of the new directions that we're going with these adaptive algorithms uh, in my lab is thinking about um, sort of unpacking some of the two things that adaptive algorithms are doing. Um, with explicitly using adaptive feature selection. This is something that a grad student in my lab, CG Ali, is working on. Um, so neural features, um, sort of the, the neurons, for instance, that might be participating in a task, um, might need to evolve over time. One reason why could be user learning. Um, Another issue could also be engineering constraints, where, for instance, say you have a wireless implant and you can only stream out a subset of channels and you then have other neural instabilities that are happening in your measurements, you may need to change the channels that you're, you're streaming out from your device. And so current CLDA algorithms adapt both the, the features that are contributing to the decoder and the decoder parameters together. Basically, there's not an explicit separation between those two. 
And so it might actually be beneficial to think about separating out how we're detecting what features are relevant for a particular task, and then the weighting of those features um, and the parameters in the decoder. Um, I also wanted to quickly mention um, other adaptive decoding de approaches uh, that have come, uh, come online recently. Um, so most of the work that I was just telling you about mostly focuses on questions of how to um, train initial decoder parameters when you don't know what the right uh, decoder should be. Um, but there's also this challenge of dealing with measurement variability. And so uh, recent work um, from uh, Aaron Batista and Byron News Lab, uh, led by Aaron Degenhart, and also uh, from Lee Miller's group, uh, led by Juan Gallego, have, have looked at this question of how to deal with neural variability. And one of the key things they noticed is that there's low dimensional structure in neural populations that's very stable over days when subjects are performing the same task. And so what they, can, they did was come up with algorithms that actually use that common structure that's remaining stable over time to then generalize decoder parameters across days, even when the measurements that you're making are, are not stable. And so this is particularly interesting because it's a unsupervised approach for dealing with, uh, for adapting your decoder over time when you have non-stationary signals. Um, and so uh, to, to wrap up uh, sort of the CLDA piece, um, there's two main applications um, for adapting your decoders. One is this issue of how do we initialize the parameters when we don't necessarily know what the brain's encoding scheme is. And another is maintaining performance over time when you have non-stationary properties like measurement variability. There's lots of different approaches for these algorithms. Some of the key distinctions are supervised versus unsupervised approaches. Um, and uh, um, there's also lots of other factors within the algorithm designs that are uh, very important to consider. Um, and you have to really tailor those to the goals of your particular application. And they need to be tested in closed loop where the algorithm is interacting with a user. Um, and particularly for issues of um, this, this interaction with the user, time scales can be, can be really important. Um, and so I have more, but I also know that uh, we wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. So I may um, actually kind of skip some of this last part and we can maybe talk about it in, um, as, as things come up. But uh, the other you know, important piece that we'll want to consider here um, is how adaptive algorithms interact with the brain that's learning at the same time. And there's a lot of really interesting questions around how to adapt a decoder without creating a moving target for the brain. And then also thinking about how can we use the fat, an, an adaptive decoder, for instance, to guide the user to an optimal solution within a system um, is another really interesting question that we're uh, thinking about in the lab. Um, and so with that, I will uh, skip, skip to the end and make sure that I thank um, all the important uh, folks that have been involved in this research, um, uh, everyone in my lab. Also, most of the work that I talked about with uh, CLDA is based uh, on my research with Jose Carmina and his group. Um, and uh, here's where you can uh, find me on the, on the web. Um, and I look forward to chatting and taking your questions. Awesome talk, thank you, Amy. So I'm looking through the Q&A, there's uh, one question from Hamid Mandi, who's asking, have uh, any of these studies been done or experiments with non or semi-invasive EEG systems? So I think all the work you did was uh, invasive, but can you speak to similar approaches for non-invasive? Right, yeah, um, it's a, a great question. So um, adaptive decoding has been done um, a fair amount in, in EEG. Um, and also I know that um, I, I'm less familiar, I, I will admit with the, um, you know, I can't 
cite chapter and verse of all of the different kinds of algorithms that have been used, but I, I certainly know that um, it is uh, has been explored. Um, Non-invasive uh, approaches have also been particularly interested in some of these questions of co-adaptation, so trying to encourage learning on the part of the of the user. Um, I think is through through these adaptive decoding approaches um, has definitely been an active area of research in EEG BCI. My understanding. Great. Our next question is from uh, Frida Heskebeck who's asking what type of decoders to use, for example, neural networks, SPM, dot, dot, dot. Right, yeah, great question. So I will go back to this slide. So most of the work that I've done so far, and I would say to some extent, uh, it's, it's kind of dominated the field of invasive motor BCIs, at least, is with the Kalman filter. Um, and so the Kalman filter is just a, a linear algorithm um, that has these two, two models, um, like I mentioned, that it, it sort of models, it's a state-based model, so it means that it, it says that there's some state that we don't know what it is that we want to estimate, in our case that's the, the movement variables, and then there's something that we're measuring, the neural activity, and we know that the neural activity is related to the movement variables, um, and we build just a simple linear model of how neural activity relates to that hidden underlying state. Um, one of the things that seems to make the Kalman filter particularly successful is that it builds in this state transition model. So it says that those movement states are going to evolve uh, over time with some predictability. Um, and so that, uh, for instance, if you're thinking about controlling cursor kinematics, you know, if I'm moving in this direction uh, at, at this particular time point with a certain speed, just based on those kinematics, I can already make a pretty good guess about where I should be at the next time point. I'm not very likely to be, you know, suddenly jumping over here. Um, and so the common filter uses those um, and models kind of the physics of the movement that's happening. Um, but uh, yeah, there are certainly some interesting uh, opportunities for thinking about how to translate CLDA types of approaches into other models. Uh, to my knowledge, it's mostly been done in these kinds of linear decoders, um, and as opposed to, for instance, like a recurrent neural network. Um, I think there's some really interesting computational challenges for thinking about how to adaptively train recurrent neural networks um, in real time. Um, and so it's actually been really interesting because um, I think things may change in the in the future, but the current state of the field mostly has shown that because of these adaptive uh, training techniques, um, uh, for instance, I work from uh, Vikash Gilja when he was at, uh, in the Schnoy group, um, you can use an adapted Kalman filter and beat a recurrent neural network that you don't retrain um, when you're using uh, in, in closed loop. Um, and so there's, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to under think about how we would uh, translate some of these approaches into more complicated algorithms. Maybe I'll ask a question. Um, Amy, when you're talking about the CLDA you know, approaches, you're saying you need to have a subject in the loop. And I'm curious your thoughts um, you know, are there situations where you can use sort of a simulated user or simulated agent to develop these algorithms and sort of what might some of the limitations be? And this is a, an active area that a number of people are working on. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think, um, I definitely think that there are some potential opportunities there. Um, I, some of the particular dynamics, for instance, of how users interact. So like the example I gave of, you know, asking a subject to use a really bad decoder for 10 minutes and they give up, I think may be difficult <laughs> to, to model in kind yeah. of a, a clearly satisfying way. Um, but, but I don't think it's impossible and I think it would definitely be interesting. Um, but I think that, you know, there, um, there's some work in my lab, for instance, where we're trying to build models of co-adaptive BCIs and how the brain interacts. Um, 
And uh, so, yeah, I definitely think that there's some really interesting computational approaches that we can think about for building models. The other is um, uh, sort of BCI simulators, I think are actually very interesting and particularly would capture some of these, you know, uh, more cognitive phenomena that I, I mentioned of, you know, user strategies where, um, so BCI simulators are where you, for instance, map, you measure a non-invasive signal like someone's movement kinematics, like their finger movements or something like that, and use that to then as inputs into a model of, you know, neural activity, how movement relates to neural firing and you have some population of neurons that you're modeling, then that population of neurons is input to a decoder that then you then adapt. Um, and so then that way the user is in the loop and can dynamically change their behavior in response to what the algorithm is, is doing. Um, so those I think are, are definitely really interesting. And they're also techniques that we, we use in the lab as, as well as many other groups. Very cool, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Maxime Verwert, who's asking, uh, can you give some examples of co-adaptation at the neural signal or user level? Sure, yeah. So um, this gets into let's see some of the pieces that I didn't talk about as much. So um, one of the uh, things that I, I have worked on is this is this idea of how do you get have an adaptive algorithm that's working at the same time as the as the brain is learning. And so we developed an approach where we, we use smooth batch, that algorithm I just proposed, to boost initial performance. Um, and so that's shown here where we started with some poor initial decoder. We then boosted up performance with smooth batch, stopped partway because we wanted to give the brain some more room to learn. And then we just kept the decoder parameters fixed and we let the user then learn and adapt over time. And so what you see is that the performance improves as they get practice with this sort of stable interface. But one of the challenges with that kind of approach is that you get measurement variability and you might lose neurons and that impacts performance. So performance here on uh, day four dropped because we lost some neurons in the ensemble. But what we did is rather than you know, starting over from scratch, we just used CLDA, the smooth batch, to tweak parameters and deal with those uh, neurons that we've lost. And so we can boost up performance there. And what was exciting is that the subject then learns and continues to improve over time. And so the idea is that we can sort of make these small gradual changes over time and the brain can track those and can, can learn. Um, and so this is sort of a form of the brain and the decoder together kind of moving. Um, and so what's particularly interesting, if you look at the neural activity and what the brain is actually doing, you know, the, one of the key questions is sort of what, what is the brain actually learning in that, in that particular case? Um, and so what we looked at was um, the direction tuning. So here's the direction that the cursor is moving uh, on the x-axis and on the y-axis is the firing rate of the neuron. And we fit a model to that. And on day one, this neuron has some reference. It fires a lot when you're moving um, you know, closer to 360 degrees. If we then look at what that neuron is doing on later days, as the subject is practicing and the decoder is getting tweaked over time, this neuron continues to sort of roughly do the same thing, but it's modulated more. So it fires more and more for that direction that it prefers. And we saw this quite a bit, it was really common. And there are certain cases even where neurons initially weren't, didn't seem to be participating in the task at all, but over time, they sort of learned that they're part of the task and are uh, important. And so they become task modulated. Um, and there's all sorts of other signatures of this where neural activity becomes more precisely recruited in time. And so one of my sort of hypotheses that we're interested in exploring in our lab is that one of the things that the brain is doing is sort of learning which parts of the brain are contributing to your decoding algorithm. Um, 
and which ones are important for that sort of behavioral readout. So it's doing kind of a credit assignment problem. Um, and I think that that, that that particular type of learning is really important for BCIs um, because there are a subset of the population um, that uh, struggle with uh, where there's this BCI inefficiency phenomenon, for instance, where some users are more proficient with BCIs than others. Um, and one possibility is that those folks that uh, have BCI inefficiency sort of struggle with that credit assignment learning process. Great, okay, the next question, uh, it's typed out, it's pretty long, but the, the, I'll just give it a short version, which is when you have a CLDA and you show the sort of stability at the end, does it extend uh, you know, beyond the many minutes you showed in your data to presumably multiple days? Yeah, yeah. So that's a, a great question. And it um, kind of stems back to actually the figure I was just showing with co-adaptation. Um, so this, uh, this, the decoder is the same between this data point and this data point here. Um, we didn't do any sort of adaptation. And so we find that um, if the neural activity remains stationary, that, you know, once you've used CLDA to learn a decoder, you can use it uh, kind of over many days um, and performance will, will not decrease and often will increase because of these learning phenomena that are happening. So the user is, is figuring out um, how to use the device. But I will say that's, that is conditioned on the neural activity staying the same, which is a non, non-trivial thing, so. Yeah, maybe to add a follow-up to that. Um, insofar as you've done kind of different random initializations, does it seem to always converge to basically the same decoder at the end? Uh, you know, I, my, my guess would be there's some sort of biomimetic optimal, which is like, I don't know, as if the monkey's moving his arm, for example. But I guess there could be different ways to do that. Um, but maybe you could imagine it converges totally you know, unpredictable new control schemes. So do you have thoughts or data on what it converges to every time? Yeah, I've looked at this a little bit. Um, and in general, it does seem like it converges to pretty similar um, things. This, it's a difficult question to ask experimentally because it requires the neural act for truly head-to-head -head comparisons, it requires the neural activity to be the same. Um, and often it's changing over time. Um, but I, my general assessment is that there is some, you know, the users aren't like coming back to the task and deciding I'm gonna do something totally different today than what I did the previous day. So they have some strategy. That said, I do think that that strategy emerges over time. I don't think that they start with it necessarily on day one. Um, and this may vary from user to user and with you know, the instructions, for instance, that subjects are given. Um, but I think that you know, for there, there probably are cases where users don't necessarily come to this task knowing this is exactly how I'm going to solve this. And you can't kind of like immediately decode it. They sort of are, we, we see kind of phenomena of like meta learning that, you know, if I were to, so this is one decoder series, for instance, um, and they learn this particular decoder. And then if I come back and I do, I then did another decoder series on top of that, um, their solution would be relatively similar um, and they would sort of continue, they, but they would also learn faster on the next one. Um, and so it, there's sort of this learning to learn phenomena and learning over that's happening over the time course of like six months to a year that I've run these experiments in addition to kind of some of these other time scales. Um, I always joke that learning, the learning that we see in BCI is sort of turtles all the way down and there's kind of the Russian nesting doll that every time you unpack it, there's sort of more time scales of learning, so. That makes total sense, thank you. Um, looks like we're out of questions from the audience, so we can give it, you know, maybe another minute to see if anyone else has questions. I think we still do have more time, so people don't be shy. Um, but in the meantime, kind of a more forward-looking question I would ask is, so a lot of this 
type of work? You know, you started when um, we were limited to like 100 electrodes and you really needed to squeeze every little bit of performance out just to get good 2D cursor control. So if you look forward to when, let's say we have, I don't know, 1,000 channel or 10,000 channel intracortical systems, so what do you see as the role for closed loop decoder adaptation in that scenario where let's say like just to do 2D cursor control works pretty well off the bat. So wh where do you push? Yeah, I think that, um, well, so I, to some extent, I would question the premise of the question that just adding more neurons is going to solve the task performance in particular, because there's a lot of data that shows that these curves kind of saturate with decoding performance saturate pretty quickly with small numbers of neurons. Um, so I'm not 100% convinced that just adding more neurons is, is the answer to the problem um, is the, the first thing. But um, I think to me, I really see some of the, the role of decoder adaptation um, as related to, well, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in, and I'll use this question to talk about some of the other things um, that we're working on is this idea of using adaptive decoding to actually shape the user's strategy in a very explicit way. So what I have like big picture, I really like the idea of devices that teach people how to use them effectively, um, rather than just relying on people to understand how to use devices um, off the bat. Um, and in particular, I think that's potentially very useful for dealing with kind of individual variability that's going to arise from lots of different underlying differences in injury, for instance, across people um, and you know, other differences of how people approach problems. Um, and so towards that goal, one of the things that we're working on is um, building models of brain decoder interactions, but um, which has been done before, but we're trying to build models that are sort of based on a slightly different conceptual framework of uh, control theory and, and game theory. Um, and so what we're trying to do is build um, models where we say that there's a brain that has some uh, cost function, kind of of how it's optimizing its behavior um, for the particular uh, goals of trying to control uh, a cursor, for instance. Um, and then there's a decoder agent um, that also has its own cost function of how it's optimizing its performance uh, for this particular task. Um, and the key thing about uh, our game theory framing is that we're saying that these two things are not necessarily the same. Uh, so the brain may have a very different goal than what the decoder's goal might be. Um, and what this allows us to do is uh, sort of treat this as a game where these two agents are interacting in a, in a dynamic way. And we can then think about how would we uh, use, um, how would we model or um, design this decoder so that we get the, the brain um, to a desired uh, endpoint. And so kind of a different way of saying this is that most machine learning algorithms and adaptive decoders um, assume that the brain is right all the time. Um, but we know that brain learning is often kind of impartial um, and biased in a lot of different ways. Um, and so an example of this is that you often see kind of encoding schemes in the brain and brain computer interfaces where, you know, say most of the neurons move the cursor kind of up and down and there's a small number of neurons that seem to move the cursor left and right in the representation that this user is, is using. Um, and so that representation that's very sparse leads to fragile decoding. Because if I lose one of the neurons that makes the cursor move left and right, it doesn't matter how much adaptive decoding I do. I can't fix the fact that the encoding is not optimal. And so the idea is that we could then have a decoder that actually um, sort of tries to optimize the way that the brain is encoding movement so that you actually had less sparse, more redundant, for instance, representations. Um, so yeah, so that's sort of a one example to me of kind of where adaptive decoding might be useful um, to kind of relate this back to other work that people have done. For instance, in um, 
some of the Pittsburgh work with the 10 degree of freedom robotic limb, um, they found that users couldn't kind of start on day one controlling a 10 degree of freedom robotic limb. They had to sort of start with simple control of, for instance, the 3D hand position and then kind of gradually increase over time. And I see potentially co-adaptation as one of the ways to think about kind of shaping that uh, training trajectory and kind of a principle. Yeah, that sounds really exciting and, and it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Okay, we actually have two more questions that popped up while you're speaking. So the first one is uh, from an anonymous attendee. Lately, I've seen a lot of work being done on deep learning models for BCI applications. Wouldn't these models benefit from more neurons being recorded since that means we have more data for training? Um, yeah, so certainly uh, machine learning algorithms kind of are only as good as the data that they're given. Um, so more data in general is always going to, to benefit um, machine learning algorithms. Um, I think the where, where I kind of differ on, you know, so I, I'm in no way suggesting that, you know, deep learning is not going to be useful for BCI applications. Um, the, where I think that the nuance is, is kind of, you know, going back to my introduction that brain machine interfaces are not just about decoding um, and that you have a user that's interacting in closed loop with that algorithm. Um, and so I actually think there's a lot of really interesting questions around how users, how the brain can learn these really complicated deep learning algorithms is actually not very clear. If you, a common filter is very intuitive, sort of the physics of how it moves makes sense. It's probably very easy for the brain to learn, oh, when this neuron fires more, the cursor moves to the right, for instance, in a common filter. If you have really complicated nonlinear dynamics that are happening in sort of a black box deep learning algorithm, I think it's an open question how the brain interacts with that and whether, um, yeah, how that, how that works in kind of a closed loop is, is a really interesting question and how to leverage deep learning um, approaches in a closed loop interaction with a human, I think is sort of a really interesting question. Absolutely, yeah, actually in our work where we did use it on, neural network, we indeed found far less benefit uh, online compared to offline, I think for the exact reasons you brought up. Mm -hmm. um, and then, okay, then the other question was, does the need for decoder adaptation give us any about how feedback is incorporated into control signals, for example, in normal motor control using limbs, or any indication about how to optimize Yeah, I think that's a, a really good question. And I definitely think that, um, you know, one of the reasons I think that we kind of need to adapt the decoders is um, is related to this issue, right? That we're, we're controlling a different system that has very different, you know, types of feedback. We don't, in current systems, we don't have um, proprioception, um, uh, for instance. And so um, I definitely think that, uh, yeah, the fact that we need CLDA, I think kind of highlights you know, this issue that it's sort of a different system. Um, and the differences in part certainly come from, from feedback, um, availability of feedback or differences in feedback available. Um, in terms of how, I would say that the current work in CLDA doesn't necessarily tell us much about how to optimize the feedback, but um, it's definitely a really interesting question and one that um, my collaborator, uh, Sam Burden, that we're working on this uh, co-adaptive model with um, is uh, we're also really interested in thinking about kind of a broader framework for BCI's incorporating control theory that I think would actually have a lot to say about how to design feedback um, because it's trying to kind of directly model this, you know, closed loop interaction and control dynamics that are happening in the system. Great, so I think that's it for questions and we're running up against the end of our hour. So thank you, Amy, for this really, really cool talk. And thank you also to the audience for you know, lots of great questions and participating. And I think we're gonna have another one of these in a month. So uh, you know, keep, keep an eye on the BCI Society calendar and uh, look forward to the next one. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, thank you.